Up next, we have uh, Jan Roberts. Jan Roberts is a recognized leader and clinician in the field of cannabis and mental health. Ms. Roberts is a licensed clinic, clinical social worker, the founder and CEO of Parkinson Health and Wellbeing, one of the largest multi site mental health and wellness private practices in the Mid Atlantic region of the United States. Ms. Roberts became interested in cannabis effects after seeing how cannabis was helpful in improving the lives of some of her clients who had experienced little help from traditional medications. After seeing her own cases improve, Ms. Roberts embarked on a path to further her understanding of cannabis and its impact on mental health and provide objective information and advocate for its healthy use. As a result of her clinical work, Ms. Roberts joined Dr. Jehan Marku in forming the International Research Center on Cannabis and Mental Health, a collaborative research institute located in New York that bridges university and community-based projects across the globe on cannabis and mental health. Ms. Roberts is the Chief Executive Officer and directional, uh, Director of Translational Research for this group, founded in 2017, which has become a recognized objective leader in cannabis research design, education, and consultation. Ms. Roberts teaches at the NYU Silver School of Social Work, where she will be awarded her doctorate in May 2019, and at CUNY Hunter College's Silverman School of Social Work. In addition to her, her academic roles, Ms. Roberts is a governor appointed member of the Delaware Medical Marijuana Act Advisory Committee, and she's the current guest editor for the Clinical Social Work Journal, upcoming special issue on cannabis and mental health, which we hope to be in. <laughs> <laughs> Most recently, Ms. Roberts joined Dr. Jehan Marku and comedian actor Greer Barnes to create a weekly podcast titled Inhab Times, which is dedicated to providing accurate analysis and commentary around cannabis research, policy issues, and its social impact in a smart and approachable and often convenient way. Ms. Roberts lives in New York and sees patients at her private practice in Manhattan. So without further ado, Jen <laughs> having me today and I'm going to talk about a few things and the slides really aren't necessarily exactly what I'm going to be talking about today but essentially you know as Randy mentioned I am a clinical social worker uh, I own a very large private practice in the mid-Atlantic area where we see 16,000 patients a year and my colleague who couldn't be here today Jehan Mark who it sounds like some of you already know Jehan um, he is also kind of a rock star in this field, having been in cannabis for about 20 years. And he and I decided that we saw a huge gap in what was happening from um, a research perspective. And the journey we started is definitely not where we are right now because it keeps evolving. This is a crazy industry, guys, as you all know, is that it's changing daily and we have to keep up with it. So essentially, what we decided we wanted to do was to um, change the way that people think and talk about cannabis. As a clinician, I was raised, if you will, to think of cannabis as a pathological substance, although I had used it in college, high school, and, and um, still as an adult. And found, you know, my training kind of made me think that anything that you, anyone who uses a substance actually would, would fit into cannabis use disorder. And for me, it was really important to kind of debunk the myths around this. So we decided to start this research institute to focus on mental health issues. And we wanted to create something that would actually make a more meaningful change. To me, research is important, but if you don't act on that research, and this is the social worker in me, if I don't act on that research, then what's the use of that? So we, we see ourselves with IRCCMH kind of as the same voice in an insane cannabis world. Because there's so much misinformation out there. There's so much, I, I see it all the time, just in, by nature of social media, really poorly designed studies being promoted as if they were the gospel. Cannabis does not cure everything. It makes a wonderful difference in the lives of some of its users and many of its users. But we really need to be able to look at cannabis objectively. So one of the things that we, we decided to focus on is research, but also education and advocacy. Whoops, I went too fast. So for research, one of the things for research that we know is that most of the research on mental health has been on animal models. 
Most of the research in general regarding cannabis is on physical illnesses. And as I got into this, and, and Mary and I have had these conversations, like there was such little data out there about what did it mean to the patients. I knew in my practice, I was seeing incredible outcomes with people with PTSD, with clients who had anorexia, clients who had other kind of traumatic issues going on, that there was something that had to be done. And so we wanted to kind of create this environment. We know that clients use, or anyone uses uh, cannabis for many reasons. Most of the reasons are for pain, anxiety, and depression. And this is where I get hung up on the word recreational use, to be honest with you, because to me, it's all therapeutic use. To me, it's about feeling better. It's about handling stress. It's about having a sense of well-being. And that is something that I think that if we, I'm very, my clients, they, I drive them crazy with this because to me it's all about the language we use. So I'm a huge proponent of changing recreational cannabis use to therapeutic use. Because really, when you ask people, the majority of the people who use cannabis, that's why they're using it. And another thing is that research out there because of political agendas have never really been focused on healthy use of cannabis. It's so quick to identify pathological use, but so slow to really look at what does healthy use look like. You know, I, I have to tell you, I remember as a kid getting in trouble in high school when my parents found the joints that I had in my, my closet. And, and now my mom just loves the fact that I'm doing this because we have deaths in our family due to opioids. We, my father was addicted to opioids because of severe pain issues and the struggles that he had with constipation for 20 years. His whole personality changed, and we have this opportunity now to really to kind of change that. One of the things, too, is we don't really talk about the endocannabinoid system and its impact on mood regulation, and that's something that's near and dear to my heart, and we have several projects going on about that, and I'll talk in a minute. But then people don't know also about standardized products and the need for standardized products. Whenever I have a client coming in who's getting their cannabis from a neighbor, I'm all about, nope, we have to do it the legal way because I need to make sure you're using safe products and that we know what kind of products that you're using as well. And so for us, IRC, CMH was started to kind of not reinvent the we all have subject matter experts in this country who focus on specific areas related to cannabis. Our goal was to actually engage all of those incredible researchers to kind of build a network across the world of people who are specialists in their areas. And, and we've done that, and every day it kind of seems like it's growing daily. And the big thing, too, is that people talk about cannabis as if it's one drug. It is not one drug. It's a compound. And we need to quit assuming that, especially in research, and this is one of my biggest issues, is that we do all this research on cannabis, but we really don't know from a molecular level, what are we talking about? What were the cannabinoids in this? What does this cannabinoid do to this part of your brain? You know? And so these are some of the reasons why we decided to get uh, IRC CMH off the ground. <laughs> so this is the cool part of what I do. So these are all the topics we're actually working on right now. We have a project with professional athletes that we're looking at their medications, prescribed medications. We're looking at their cannabis use. We're looking at their, um, it's in process right now, so I can't really tell you what the data is showing, but it's actually looking at even their sexual functioning their sleep, because no one talks about sexual functioning. The biggest reason people get off of SSRIs or other antidepressants is because of sexual side effects. And because of my clinical use and knowing kind of, um, well, I have a lot of, like, like, seven sex therapists on staff, so this is an area very interesting to us. And so we're looking at sexual functioning. We have a project right now with veterans that um, we were trying to have it in Delaware, but unfortunately supply issues have been, I think for any researcher, that's always the biggest issue that we run into. We know that patients run into it as well, but to guarantee a standardized type of medication for this trial, 
we couldn't do that there. So luckily, we've just partnered with a group in New York that we have uh, guaranteed standardized supply that we're going to be following with our veterans. And we're also going to be looking um, at cannabis use among the veterans. We have several interventions that we're putting in, so we'll be able to kind of see if our interventions actually impact usage as well. Because at the end of the day, we also want to promote healthy usage of endocannabinoids. <coughs> cannabis just because of the impact on the endocannabinoid system. Another area is um, I did a pilot study on mental health clinicians last spring, and it's actually gotten funded to go global, and it's a much larger study that's in process right now. But we are asking mental health clinicians, what do they know, what do they not know about cannabis? Because as, as, as it was alluded to earlier, addiction psychiatry is typically you know, has, has, has seen this as a pathological use and has seen any kind of substance as a way that people are harming themselves. And for me, I, I have seen, again, in my practice what's happened, but this is, this is fascinating. From the pilot study that we collected data on, what we found was that it actually, you know, mental health clinicians, depending on their education level, that impacted whether or not they were more likely to recommend cannabis for their clients. They were also more likely to recommend it for physical reasons rather than for mental health reasons like anxiety or even PTSD. Out of the mental health symptoms that people had, they were more likely to um, see it as a helper for PTSD, but things like anorexia, anxiety, things like, um, I'm trying to think of all the variables. <laughs> we, had, we had so many, you know? Um, so, even other substance use issues, even opioid use disorder, they weren't very supportive of that. One of the things we also learned about mental health clinicians is that if they ever tried it before or used it in the past, they knew that it wasn't so scary, and they were more apt to recommend it to their clients. So we're doing some more work around that. We're hoping, I can't wait to see what this next round of data is going to do, um, but, but it's really kind of exciting. Uh, one of the areas, too, is that we're looking at head trauma and trying to see kind of what's going on related to that. We, I can't really kind of talk much about that right now. But um, as a clinician, what I would like to see, and, and we are measuring this with our, our um, athletes, is looking at how cannabis impacts benzodiazepine use. We talk about opioids a lot. But for those of you who don't know what a benzodiazepine is, that's Clonopin, Ativan, Xanax. And, and these drugs are highly, highly physically addictive. And in fact, more people use benzos than opioids. And psychiatrists are easy to prescribe benzos. They're, they're quick to prescribe benzos. And that is one of the areas we have to look at because benzos are, are used to help people with anxiety disorders, and we need to be able to see if cannabis can help mitigate that piece as well. Now, I have to tell you, education is, is huge for me, because again, I find that a lot of consumers have very little education about cannabis. In the states where I work, um, in one state, we have it so that the patient advocates or butt tenders are the ones making medical decisions for clients. That is incredibly problematic. I had a client, for example, who um, she had had, gosh, she'd been hospitalized 21 times, she was 45 years old, and had anorexia since she was 12. And, Cannabis, she started using cannabis, and she went to the dispensary to get it. They never told her anything. They recommended her use certain varieties. And she started taking Clonopin with it because it was so activating for her, for her anxiety. And when I heard, she came to me afterwards, and when I heard about that, I was like, oh, no, no, no. And, and those are some of the issues that patients are facing every day. They don't understand because the, the infrastructure is not there to provide them this kind of information. And so we were able, consequently, to get her on another variety that she didn't need that. And it was actually very helpful. And she hasn't been in the hospital for about a year and a half, which is incredible for this client. Um, another thing is that we, we present all the time, not just for consumers, but for you know, patients, for professionals as well, because one of my passions is to dispel this myth 
for mental health practitioners. There are so many myths around cannabis that um, it, it's just mind-boggling. Have you heard of Alex Berenson's book, Tell Your Children? Well, I have to tell you, one of the best things about, whoops, I'm gonna skip to this. One of the best things, these guys down here, so I have, we have this podcast called New Hope Times, and please, it's on iTunes, Spotify, you can check it out. We have five episodes, but we're using a global way of educating people. This podcast, um, we're, we're, we're challenging Alex Berenson to come on it, and we keep, I don't want to say troll, that's the wrong word, but some of the stuff that he's done is so scary to me. We actually, Greer, my friend Greer, the guy next to me, um, he's an actor and comedian. He's all crashing on HBO and, and used to write for the Chappelle Show, his old Chappelle Show. And Greer knows Pete Davidson. If you read this book, Alex Berenson calls out Pete Davidson and is actually being an example of how cannabis can make you crazy and volatile. And so we're trying to really kind of use our platform that is actually based on true scientific data to kind of dispel a lot of these myths around cannabis. Um, part of our topics have been about the endocannabinoid system because Jayhan and I are such nerds and such geeks. We can totally get like in our nerd space, but we're really trying to make it approachable for everyone so that they can learn more about what cannabis is. Because I want my patients, I want everyone to go into the dispensary and say, I don't care if it's about endocrine or sativa. What's the cannabinoid profile of this strain or this variety? That's what we want to do. We want people to understand that we want them to have a healthy functioning endocannabinoid system, not a dysregulated one. And for me as a clinician, that tells me that my clients aren't using it. You know, I teach them about what does taking too much do to you, because you really want to pay attention to this so cannabis can actually help you. It can help you lead a vital life. You know, I, I know I'm very open about my own use because for me, it's about dispelling the myths. I don't know many more people more like motivated to do things than me. And, and my mom and I joke about it because, you know, she's 80 and, and gray hair and all that. And I'm like, remember those days? And she just is like, yeah, my daughter's a smart now. You know, so she's learning all about it. We've done things related to, um, like CBD products. We actually created a consumer warning for people. There were some studies out of Virginia Commonwealth talking about the actual counterfeit CBD that, that's widely available, that has all these contaminants in it, that people think that they're using this product to help themselves to relieve their anxiety, not knowing what in the world is in this product. And it's actually causing more harm than good. And it is, our, it is our obligation. I feel very strongly that if I have this knowledge, it is my job to teach my patients and to teach the world what we can do. I do believe that cannabis is a way to positively impact well-being. You hear me talk a lot about health. And, and I want people to understand that this is a new way of seeing what well-being can be. So these are just some of our partnerships that we have for research. We have projects, uh, we're about to do a project in Latin America, we've got one in Canada and Australia, we've got several here um, in the US. Uh, Jay Hunt, we do everything from working with states and the regulations with medically accepted conditions. We actually work with the labs as well. So we're kind of like the hub where we bring experts in to kind of change the way we think about cannabis. And we've been featured in these publications as well. And I'm so excited. Here's our little logo, the cuter logo for New York Times is so much cuter. It's like a little cartoon of the three of us. So it's kind of funny. But anyway, please do listen to it because it actually is cool. But uh, anyway, that's it. And so thank you so much.